I'm Scott Allen-Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua today. We've got viewer questions that we're going to be getting to from Brent Oxelider or something like that. People get some weird names. He has a number of questions about how residency process triggering works, which is a great question because I don't think we really touch on that too often. Some questions about bicycles and other two-wheeled vehicles that we're going to get to right after the bump. All right, I'm going to start right off by reading this message from Brent Oxalit. Oxalit. You can figure that one out on your own. Just wondering when you mentioned in passing that they're pushing you to get residency. Is that when you're applying for extensions and or making border runs? Also, I assume the vehicle registration scenario is the same for two wheels. All CC size motorcycles? One last question. Uh, I can see myself just using a bicycle to, to ride bicycle to ride around town and maybe even a little beyond. Do you ever ride one around town or two, for example, to Las Penitas, or do you just prefer walking? Great content as always. As always, mention that the content's great. I'm more likely to put your question on the show. All right, so the first question up is when do you find out that it's time to do your registration? I mentioned this a bit. I say don't don't like worry about this other than having like kind of a plan in your background, have a lawyer ready, but don't don't be in a rush. To to do your residency under normal circumstances. Again, always someone who's an exception. I'm not saying it's 100%, but for the majority of you, relax. Do your tourist thing, do your renewals, do your border runs, and don't focus so heavily on getting your residency. They will let you know. Okay, but they will let you know that's kind of ambiguous. What does that mean? Great question. So you're exactly right. If you're going to do your border run and you're coming back into the country, this is a trigger point where they may mention to you that it's time to get your residency. This is a point where they're checking your paperwork and they may be like, oh, you've been doing this a bit. You also, so some people don't get extensions. This is worth mentioning, right? Extensions are not a guarantee. I know people who've been here for many years, they've never done an extension because their natural travels cause them to be out of the country within 90 days. So they never need an extension. So there are people, probably not the norm, who are here for a long time but never meet their local office for extensions, or that's a Migracion, or they never go to Managua for, for any kind of paperwork uh, with Migracion. And so it's easy-ish to have the border control be the only place that you're regularly interacting with Migracion. And it's worth pointing out, the people at the border, the people in your local town, the people in Managua, all of those are part of Migracion. Migracion is a department that handles immigration. Recently, and this is quite recent, within the last year, and I think within the last six months, although it's been in the works for a while, they decided that having that as a completely independent division didn't make sense. So they've been rolled into the police infrastructure. So when you're talking to Migracion, they are ranking police officers the same as people who are on the street, you know, beat cops, or if you're talking to inspectors, uh, if you're talking to uh, the, 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 the Negra, the, the police that are in the black with the, the guns that like protect important spots, like they'll protect monuments. All those are different police divisions, but they're all in the same hierarchy and they all report through the police infrastructure. That's relatively new, but it means that there is a communications channel between the border and your Migracion office and Managua and all the police stations. They're on a single computer system and single hierarchy. So communications, in theory, is going to be better than it was in the past. In the past, sometimes getting things between different departments took a bit more effort. So hopefully that's good. I have no idea, but that is a point of note that that is something that has changed. Anyone who's dealt with it in the past were used to Migracio not being police officers. Obviously, they worked with the police. They were very closely tied, but they weren't actually part of the official police infrastructure. So now they are. So uh, for now, if you're going out all the time and you never have to get an extension, the chances that you're going to trigger the need for residency much, much lower, right? So maybe it'll never come up for you, but it could. If you're only going out for a few days every night, you know, you're just doing a border run every 90 days because you didn't know about the extensions, and trust me, those people exist, then you're gonna hit it that way. So the border will say it to you. If you're doing your extensions, chances are the extension office, which just Migracion, it's not called the extension office, they're likely the ones who are going to do it because they're reviewing your case more thoroughly, they're paying more attention, they get to know you personally. If you're going through, let's for example, Pinas Blancas, the border at Costa Rica, they handle 
an outrageous number of foreigners every day. Like it's just crazy, hundreds at a time, thousands every day. So they don't really pay attention to you and think about you and, and they're not like acutely aware of your personal situation. They're just looking at your paperwork and you're counting on a border agent to make a determination uh, to remind you at that point. So that's not ideally where you would do it, and it's not where it's most likely to happen. And when you're doing your extensions, especially if you're doing it in your remote cities, if you're doing it in Managua, they're still getting big volume. If you're doing it like here in Leon, the people who are doing it are going to get to know you pretty quickly. It's a small office and they only process a small number of people a day. Don't get me wrong, they're busy, right? The line is often out the door, they do reservations now, they can go down the street, but everything moves very slowly. There's a ton of paperwork to do, there is a lot of manual work, a lot of pe the same people coming and going. And a lot of the people, the majority, I think, I would say 90% from my personal observation, of the people who are there are Nicaraguans who are there for normal daily things. Like they would just want a passport renewal or they need to file some paperwork or whatever for them to come and go from the country, not uh, people like us, like expats, who are working on getting visa extensions. We are absolutely the exception. Now, maybe if you're in like Rivas or Granada, where you've got just loads and loads of tourists in a smaller population area, then maybe you get, I don't know. But out here in Leon, where we have a really large population and we really don't have that many expats, you, you absolutely have it just full of Nicaraguans. And the number of times that I've run into an expat in the office is very few. I mean, two or three times and like one person. I can tell you who I've ran into there and I've run into Nicaraguans that I've known just as often as I've run into expats that I've known. Mostly I run into people I don't know, right? It's always busy, but, but having just loads of expats there not really a thing. And we go at times where you would expect there to be some number uh, because we're all, you know, collecting our passports at the same time or whatever. There's some shipments that come in. So some things that would cause us to be there around the same time. And we just don't run into that many people that way. So it's, it's really not uh, statistically what that office is doing. So the point of that being that if you're going to those offices, likely they're going to get to know you really quickly. So that office is going to know the details of your case. They're going to know what your plans are. They may have discussions with you. It's going to be a very different experience because you're asking for an extension. You have to tell them why. Normally, you know, we say, well, you know, we love being in Nicaragua. We want to spend more time. We haven't gotten enough time to be there, which is absolutely the case, right? So that makes sense. And that's often the reason that you get granted an extension. Um, if you're doing business or something, you can say that. What, whatever applies to you personally. But uh, they, they can talk to you and, and that... Uh, they get to know you and they understand like, oh, you know what? We know they're only planning on being here for six more months. There's no reason to talk to them about residency, right? Or they're planning on staying here. They're just waiting for us to tell them about residency that may move it up, right? There, there's a number of things. Uh, but this, it really, because it's, uh, this is one of the spots where Nicaragua is just wildly different than like in the United States. The United States is very process driven. You would never have this person who's just like looking at your paper going, I think it's time, right? That would never happen. They would have a very strict guideline. You've done this, you've done that, you've done this and that by chat, it's time to tell you, right? But here it's a discussion. Here it's a, how does it feel? Ah, this person seems to be like they're going to stay. So we, I think it's time we'll, we'll tell this. Or we're really busy with paperwork, so we're not going to do it right now because we, we can't handle the extra paperwork, right? Like it's a completely different process in general. And it's much more decision making. It's much more the person on the spot is saying, uh, what do I think we should do in this case? And it, potentially you could be like, I, should I do this? Just have a conversation. And they could be like, you know what? I do. It's probably best if you did. Or, you know, no, you don't need to worry about it. You're gone so much. This You don't need to do it. Right. It, it's it, it's funny how much that stuff changes your experience and how much going between the two countries, it's that kind of stuff that is so different. And you're just, I grew up in America. And so we're so used to, you know, we know exactly how these things are supposed to work. Of course they break sometimes, but they, it's very, very by the book and it's very predictable. And in Nicaragua, it's so much just a call and ask, have a conversation. See what you can do. Plead your case, right? You know what? I, I can't do residency. It's going to, I have this problem. I have that problem, but I'm only going to be here for this long. Can, can we work something out? Hmm. Well, if you promise to go at this time and you do these things, I, we can let it slide, right? Like it's, it's totally different. I'm not saying one's better or one's worse. It's just, wow, such different systems. And, and you got to be flexible with that. It'll 
completely change your experience. If you're thinking of Nicaragua like the United States, it will be very confusing in many cases. You'll have no idea, like, how does this work? But when you think about it in the right way, it's like, oh, okay, this works because it's nothing works the way it does in the United States. So when everything's flexible, it's really not such a problem. You couldn't do it with just one thing or another and not others. If the U.S. started doing Nicaraguan type processes in the middle, what a mess it would be or vice versa. But because the U.S. is all process driven and Nicaragua is all conversation and decision driven, it works. But it's very confusing until you get used to it. The second part of Brent's question was about two-wheeled vehicles, you know, motorcycles and dirt bikes and that kind of stuff. Do they get registered and follow the same laws as cars and trucks and, and those kinds of things? And the simple answer is yes, they do. It is a single process for everything. Yes, licenses need to be by car or uh, motorcycle, but the size of your engine, all that stuff doesn't matter. If you have a gas-powered vehicle, you need to be registered. If you have a human-powered vehicle, you don't have to be registered, more or less. That's all there is to it. If you're gonna use battery driven, this is where it becomes a problem a little bit because we're used to things like in the United States, we're really familiar with the idea that electric assist vehicles, that's like a bicycle with a battery, they just let that slide. They're like, yeah, it's a little bit of an engine, but you're still powering it. You still got pedals, so it's a bicycle. But here they say, um, how is that different than a motorcycle? It has an engine, it has a power pack, and you don't have to pedal. That makes it a motorcycle. So here it's actually funny that it's a little bit more black and white. In the US you're like, ah, it doesn't seem like a motorcycle. Does it need to be? And here they're like, does it have an engine? Nope, it's, it's gotta be registered. Now, could you get away with it? Are they gonna catch that it has a battery pack? Are they gonna catch that it has an engine? Are they gonna catch that you're not pedaling? Maybe, maybe not, but officially I'm told if it's an electric bike, it is an electric motorcycle the same as any other electric motorcycle. And if you think about it, how do you define the difference between an electric bicycle, electric power assist bicycle, an electric you don't have to pedal but you could if you wanted to bicycle, and a you can't pedal, it's an well, you know, obviously one you could pedal, but when you need to pedal but it helps, or you don't need to pedal but it does it for you, but you could pedal if you want, like you're getting into a lot of gray area of the, the truth is it has an engine, it has power, maybe it should be a vehicle, and I realize that maybe, you know, you can make rules like, ah, oh, well, it doesn't go above 10 kilometers an hour, so that's different. Sure, you can do those things, but then is it going downhill? How do you, like, it does actually get complex. So what my understanding is that they do here is that all of those vehicles are all just listed as needing to be registered, but a lot of people don't register them and treat them as bicycles and just act like they don't know. How much trouble can you get in? I don't know, so I'm not giving you any advice. I'm just telling you what people do. And under no circumstances am I advising you on, on how to handle that. Now, the question was, uh, could you just get around with a bicycle if you're in some place like Las Benitas? Absolutely, you can, and a lot of people do, loads and loads of people, especially Nicaraguans, uh, use bicycles to get around in Las Benitas and Ponaloya. Uh, that area is, is basically flat along the beach, very easy to get all through that area. There is a little, little bit of a hill, I mean, it's not bad at all, in between the two beaches, but that's it. You have the entire stretch of Las Bonitas that's flat. Go up a little bit, and then down to Punaloya, and then it's all flat. And then at the far end of Punaloya, it goes up pretty significantly, just right at the end. Um, and that's it's easy to push your bike up if you don't feel like uh, uh, biking it um, for that last little tiny bit. So that area is fantastic for that. Do I ride a bicycle down there? No, for a couple of reasons. One. Some of you know, a lot of you don't, I used to be serious bicyclist when I was young, like hard core. So I love the idea of using a bike to go places. However, I'm now much heavier than I was when I was young. I have not biked in a really long time, and I don't like going out and buying things that if I don't know if I'm going to use them. So I don't own a bike these days. Um, and one of the reasons that I don't like having a bike down in some place like the beach is, one, I do like walking. So it's no big deal for me to just walk the entire distance. Like, that's no problem at all. But really importantly, I like the flexibility of not having a bike to deal with. Uh, bikes are easily stolen, so you're going to want to have a lock. You're going to want to lock it to something. You're going to want to watch it. Most people go into work or into their home and store it in a locked area. Um, if you're just going up and down the beach, you may not have access to that. So you're going into a restaurant, you're like, where can I put this? And of course, there's ways to deal with it. I would find that very cumbersome. Um, I would not enjoy doing that. I'd feel like I always had to watch my bike and be aware of it. And it's just, it's more than I want to deal with. I'm very comfortable just going out and walking outrageously far distances where I wouldn't think twice about it. And then I don't have anything. I don't have to worry about carrying anything, looking after anything. My phone's in my pocket. That's all I've got, right? It's very, very simple. Um, and when, I, when I'm looking for me personally on the beach, when I'm looking to upgrade from uh, uh, just walking everywhere, I'm thinking about an electric golf cart or anything. If I'm going farther than I feel comfortable walking, 
I want something I can take people and it's electric and it's easy. I don't want to deal with a bicycle. It's like, a, it, for me, at this age, with what I do, it's kind of a halfway measure that brings the, the encumbrances of bringing things with you and doesn't give me enough to get past the walking to make that make sense for me. Now, I don't live so close to the beach that I'm just gonna hop on a bicycle and go. I'm about 12 kilometers, maybe 15, somewhere in there. So if I was to bike to the beach, that would still be a major bike. I'd be all sweaty and hot. If I walk, I'll also be sweaty and hot. I can do either. Both are a big undertaking, so it's not casual. There are a few people who bike all the time. They're younger than me, they're used to the heat, and they do bike from the city to Las Bonitas daily. And if you're in really great shape, you can totally do that, and it's reasonable, but it will take you 30 minutes to an hour at least. There is quite a bit of hills between there and here, uh, so it, it will give you a workout. It is not flat. Leon is mostly flat. Las Bonitas is flat, but in between, definitely not flat. Parts of it, yeah, but lots of it are not flat. So it would be a serious workout, and, and a lot of people do it, so, so don't think that you can't. And also, the open highway is not the safest thing. So a lot of the people who do it are either being super risky or they have chase cars that follow behind them and block traffic from them. Well, if I'm gonna do that, I've kind of defeated the purpose. Yeah, I'm getting some exercise, but now someone's gotta drive behind me. It still takes them a really long time. I'm not making it ecologically uh, advantageous because we're still using a car. It's just, I'm going extra. Like, uh, it's fine for the people who are training, but for me, it would not solve anything. Um, and I don't want to take that risk all the time of being clipped. Those roads are relatively dangerous, not that someone's gonna stop and stab you, that someone's going to clip you as they go by. They're not super careful, people drive too fast, and, and people just don't pay that much attention. It is risky. I like walking because I can pay attention to the cars, and if they're coming too close, I can step away. And I do from time to time, and that keeps me safe, so that's worth it for me. If I had a really good electric bike where I could pedal some, but really it's gonna do a lot of the work, I might skew my decision the other way. That has crossed my mind, and at some point I may do that, uh, especially down on the beach. No one's gonna give me a hassle on the beach. Am I gonna ride it to and from Leon? Uh, probably not, but maybe if I have one that can do that distance and I don't have to pedal any, I can. Like, I'd be great to get exercise, but if I know that I can be tired and, and never have to worry about it, great. Like, I might pedal a little, but I'll let it do most of the work. At that point, maybe. I won't do it when it's heavy traffic. I won't do it in the dark but I might do it in the middle of the day when I just wanna go back and forth and I want something really casual and I can you know, put my cameras on things and get beautiful views. There are advantages to using the bike. You can get these beautiful smooth shots for really long distances. Yes, that has crossed my mind and I might go that path at some point, but without the electric for me, not worth it. Um, so that's kind of where I am. But if you really like biking and you want to live near the beach where you would have your bike with you, you want to take it in a car or something, absolutely. Getting around on the beach on a bike is a great way to go. Um, and anything that helps with the traffic down there is fantastic because we don't have space for cars on the beach. And it is a continuous problem trying to deal with where you're going to park, getting through the streets, uh, the more golf carts, bicycles, people walking, and that kind of stuff that we can do. And the more group uh, if we're going to bring in a vehicle, it should hopefully be for groups of people, not for individuals. Uh, all that stuff helps a lot. Sorry for the weird light on my face today. Um, so, yeah, I would encourage you to consider using a bike, but also be aware that, you know, it will walk away if you're not careful. Uh, it is an easy thing for someone to grab. And uh, once they have your bike, what are you going to do? You can chase them on foot, but they got your bike, right? They're faster than you now. So just be aware that that, that is potentially a problem. For all of you who have questions like this, please, I encourage you to either get down in those comments and ask them as Brent did, or even better, there's all the instructions down there in the description of the episode on how to record uh, yourself and send it in to me. I would love to have you guys uh, on the video. I love clipping you in. We don't get to do this very often, but I really request that people do that. It's it's so neat when people do, and you can be on the show, and I can answer your questions that way. Uh, that would be fantastic, so I encourage you one way or another, participate, get down and say hello, if nothing else. I love all the conversation that we have down there, and if you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That comes directly to me and helps pay for the cameras and the uh, all the things that we do. It takes a lot of equipment and time to make this show, and I love doing it, and that helps me be able to do it more, as always. Like and subscribe, share on social media, tell someone you know about the show, get them to watch, and hopefully get them hooked. And I will see all of you tomorrow. And I'll do my best to pop four more episodes from our vast collection up on the screen. And if you would be so kind as to click on one that looks interesting or the one that looks most interesting to you and let it play, that would be fantastic.